Well, hello, welcome to the Lessons of Vietnam show. Tonight, we're very, very fortunate to have a special guest. But before we get started with our guest, I'm your host, Bill Dixon, Vietnam 67 68, uh, Army uh, Tet Survivor. Uh, we're broadcasting from uh, international headquarters of Nissan Communications, worldwide uh, broadcast. You might want to go on and look at some of his other shows, especially the one he does. Uh, to participate in the show yourself, ask questions or make comments or whatever, uh, I invite you to call 919-518-9773, or even better, go on to Skype, Computers 2K Voice, and there it is spelled out for you right there on the screen, Computers 2K Voice. So uh, as we move on to uh, our next uh, next slide that we always have, uh, this is a time of year that... Uh, is tough on a lot of veterans and non-veterans. Uh, Christmas time, uh, I was given a number yesterday for a 92-year-old World War II veteran who has no family, uh, just to give him a call and let him know that somebody was out there. And if you know of a veteran that's uh, it, it's having a problem in crisis, encourage him to call uh, the crisis line that you see on the screen, 1-800-273-8255. Or you call yourself and get some information about how to help them. But the Veterans Crisis Line, there is someone there 24 hours a day to talk with uh, the veterans out there. Well, let's stop these 2022 20, veterans. Uh, uh, they talk about a day commit, uh, that uh, ending their lives. Uh, so if you are out there and you're a veteran, please uh, call the number. Uh, I know it's hard, but do it. Uh, it, a lot of us uh, stayed away from the word VA for a long time and don't stay away from the crisis line. Uh, now going on to our uh, guest, uh, Colonel Andrew Finlayson, uh, is a 1966 graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy who served 25 years in the U.S. Marine Corps as an infantry officer. He spent 32 months in South Vietnam as a force reconnaissance platoon commander. And I'm going to have him tell you what that is. Uh, infantry company commander, which should be fairly easy, and a provincial, a provincial reconnaissance unit uh, commander and advisor. From his retirement from the U.S. Marine Corps in 1991 until 2007, he worked for the Vinell. Uh, is it Vinell? No. Vinell, okay. And Northrop Grumman Corporations in management positions specialized in military training, strategic planning, and security biometrics. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and Romania, his most recent publication is a book entitled Killer Kane and Marine Long-Range Recon Leader in Vietnam in 1967-68. He is author of several articles and studies related to the Vietnam War, and I would read you all of his superlatives, but then we wouldn't have any time left for the show. Uh, Colonel, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, and, and let you uh, take it from there, and I'm going to ask you some questions if it's okay as we go along from time to time. Uh, there's your uh, uh, central intelligence, and I believe the other stuff is some of the uh, factual history uh, books on the screen there. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you and Okay, go well, thank, thank you, Bill. I appreciate it. That was a very kind uh, introduction. Uh, I'm here today to talk about uh, primarily my 32 months experience in the Vietnam War. I wrote two books specifically uh, to deal with that. The first book, uh, which I have here in my hand, uh, it's called Killer Kane. It covers my first tour of duty in Vietnam. I spent 13 months uh, there as a uh, reconnaissance platoon commander with the First Force Reconnaissance Company. On my second tour, it lasted eight, 19 months because I extended. I wrote a second book called Rice Paddy Recon. Um, Next slide. I wrote these books because uh, I was... I wanted, I wanted to write a combat memoir that was factually accurate and gave historians an example of what one officer experienced during 32 months during the Vietnam War. And I did that because I saw that a lot of the books written by uh, other veterans and also but primarily by journalists and historians uh, did not, they, they were not as factually accurate as they should be. There were a lot of inaccuracies, inaccuracies in those books. And I wanted to write something that was very specific and very accurate. And uh, that is why my books are heavily footnoted, even though they're combat memoirs. Um, do you have any questions for me? Uh, about well, Kurt, I want to ask you, I'll start with, how did you, how did you, why did you become a Marine and 
What, what was it all about? How did you get well, there? Well, that's an interesting story. You know, my father was a uh, naval officer during uh, the Pacific campaign in World War II. Um, and uh, I, he was very patriotic, and he instilled that patriotism in me. I lived in a very small town called Merchantville. Uh, it's near Philadelphia, a town of only about 3,700 people. And when I grew up, it was a very idyllic place. I loved the people there, and I, uh, I loved the town itself. Um, I thought, well, I'm a, a person of mediocre talents and abilities. What can I do for my town? And uh, I thought about this for a long while, and I decided that I would go into the military. I went down to a reserve center in Camden, New Jersey, near our town, and uh, I initially thought I would go into the Navy like my father. But while I was sitting there waiting to talk to a Navy chief recruiter, a uh, gentleman came in wearing dress blues. Uh, he was a Marine sergeant major named Bailey. And uh, he came up to me and he said, young man, what are you, what are you doing here? And he, I said, well, sir, I'm interested in going to the Naval Academy. And I thought if I joined the reserves, I'd have a good chance of doing that. And he said, well, have you thought about going into the Marine Corps? And I said, well, I haven't really thought about it too much, but I respect the Marine Corps. He says, well, come with me. So we left the, the Navy recruiter's office and went over to the Marine recruiter's office. He sat me down and convinced me that I should be a Marine. Uh, long story short, uh, while I was still in high school, uh, I decided to join the Marine Corps Reserve, the 68th Rifle Company in Camden, New Jersey. Came home with the paperwork. My father was uh, not too pleased about it, but my, my mother just bawled her eyes out. She cried the entire time, but she signed it, uh, signed it anyway, and I became a, a, a Marine uh, when I was 17 years old and still in high school. Uh, I applied for and was accepted into the Naval Academy, and then while I was in the Naval Academy, uh, I decided I was going to continue as a Marine and was commissioned as second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. All right, well, that's, uh, that's how you were uh, uh, got to the Naval, Naval Academy. Then. That's right, I went to the Naval Academy. You call it a, a trade school. I, yeah. uh, it's not really a university, but... I learned my trade. Well, what what uh, what what did you do when you when you got out of there? You went straight into the Marines. I went right into the Marine Corps, and I went to uh, where all Marine officers go to. I went to the basic school, and that's where they teach every Marine officer to be a rifle platoon commander. Uh, even our pilots, uh, you know, if they're shot down, they can take charge of a, a defensive position. Uh, no matter what your job is in the Marine Corps, you're basically a rifleman, and the officers know how to at least uh, command a platoon. Uh, after that, uh, I was asked uh, if I wanted to volunteer for anything, and you know, not being the brightest uh, brightest person, I said, "Well, I'll volunteer for the infantry, and I will volunteer for Vietnam." And the Marine Corps accepted that and sent me over immediately. Uh, when I got to uh, Vietnam, I was uh, I traveled with a friend of mine who was in my same basic school class, Tom Dowd, who was later killed. We both reported to the First Marine Division. And there, the personnel officer told us we would both go to the 1st Battalion, 1st Marines. But we stayed there the night. The next morning, the personnel officer, when we reported to get our orders to go to the 1st Marines, said, Finlayson, uh, you're not going to the 1st Marine, Marines. You're going down the road here to the 1st Force Reconnaissance Company. And when he told me that, I, uh, I was extremely anxious because I knew what kind of work they did. And I said to the personnel officer, listen, uh, I'm not trained as a reconnaissance officer. I'm just a basic Marine infantry officer, no experience with reconnaissance. And he said, uh, that doesn't make any difference. They just had an officer there killed, and you're jump qualified. You're parachute qualified. They want a parachute qualified officer. You're the only one we've got. You're going down there. So I went down there with a lot of trepid trepidation and uh, worry. Um, thankfully uh, for me, uh, they sent me on three what they called snap-in patrols, where I went with enlisted patrol leaders and uh, officer patrol leaders and sort of learned my craft on the job by looking over the shoulder of these more experienced uh, patrol leaders. And after three patrols, they said, uh, Finlayson's ready to take them out. And then for the next 10 months, uh, I was a patrol leader for a, a, a team that was it gained a lot of uh, notoriety. It was actually quite famous. It's called Killer Kane. It's the subject of my first book. And Killer Kane uh, conducted 34 long-range reconnaissance patrols in enemy-controlled territory far from friendly lines. Because First Force Reconnaissance Company, unlike, unlike the Reconnaissance Battalion, conducted deep reconnaissance. But we conducted patrols outside the artillery fan, often uh, many 
as much as 20 or 25 miles away from friendly units. Colonel, they uh, they can get they can get the book and find out all the good details. They sure uh, can. But well, I want to ask you for those out there who not quite uh, understand, where were you, by the way? Uh, where where were you? Uh, we were located in uh, Kwangnam Province. Where we occupied a camp called Camp Reasoner, which was located near uh, Hill 27 between Hill 27 and uh, Da Nang Air Base. But we operated in Tua Tien Province, Kwangnam Province, and Kwang Tin. So you were basically what we call I Corps. You were up. You were up close to the DMZ. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what exactly does a force recon uh, platoon do? Well, probably the, the the best description I can give you is of a, of a patrol. Um, and this may take a, a few minutes, but I think it's it's worth uh, talking about. Uh, this patrol took place on the fourth of July, nineteen sixty seven, and um, it's representative of the kind of a harrowing patrol that we had. It really began two days before that when the commanding officer or commanding general of the 1st Marine Division received an intelligence briefing that a large number of North Vietnamese soldiers, perhaps as many as 500, had moved out of their base camp in uh, Laos and crossed into uh, uh, Quang Nam province and were moving along the main infiltration route into that province and placed that, uh, a trail that was called the Yellow Brick Road by the Marines. Unfortunately, the Yellow Brick Road was obscured from the air because of the high canopy and uh, thick foliage uh, uh, on top of it. So the general said, uh, there's only way, one way we're going to find this, this unit and, and perhaps divert a E-52 strike on it is I'm going to insert a ground reconnaissance team into this area. <clears throat> and I want it done quickly. So the orders came down uh, from, uh, from the division down to the 5th platoon, which I commanded. And the general had specifically asked for my, my team to do it. Uh, he had said that this team had conducted several high-risk patrols and been successful. So he said, I want Killer, T Killer Kane to conduct this mission. Uh, we had very little time to prepare for it, no area of reconnaissance, uh, no search for LZs or anything like that. The weather over this area was uh, very bad. It was raining with a lot of uh, thick fog. And we had to wait on the LZ for all day long, waiting for the weather to clear. But at the end of the day, we finally got word that we would uh, board the helicopters and, and make the insertion. Try to make three insertions into, or two, two insertions into uh, small landing zones uh, near the uh, trail. But both uh, times we were shot out of, the, out of the zone. We could not, could not get in. Um, the pilot asked me if we should abort the mission. I said, no, uh, we're going to go in tomorrow anyway. Let's get it out, out of the way, do it now. So we searched for another LZ. It was getting a little dark at that time, and uh, I could tell he wanted to go home, but uh, we finally found a place on a ridge line overlooking the valley where the trail was located, and we inserted. We spent the night uh, with mosquitoes and, and uh, leeches feasting on our blood, but the next morning we moved down into the valley, and to make a, a long story short, we encountered the North Vietnamese patrols twice we won the firefights, but uh, we had to run. We knew that uh, there were a lot of NVA in that, uh, in that valley, and uh, so our mission really was accomplished, and we decided we would needed an emergency extraction. But we knew there were very few landing zones in this area, and we didn't know where they were. The only one we knew of was the one where we were inserted. So we went back there. Um, we spent the night, because it was getting dark, we spent the night uh, in this thick um, bamboo and uh, uh, elephant grass again with rain and, and uh, mosquitoes and leeches. In the morning, it was bright and clear, uh, looked good for a, an extraction early in the morning. We were told by radio that probably an hour or two, uh, the helicopters would come to pick us up. We were all feeling very good. Uh, however, uh, while I was sitting uh, in the little harbor site we had, uh, Sergeant Hugh tapped me on the shoulder and he placed his hand in front of his face. Uh, recon teams do not talk on patrol. We use hand and arm signals. We even whisper when we're on the radio. And he tapped me on the shoulder, placed his, his hand in front of his face, which was the signal for uh, he had spotted the enemy. And then he cupped his ear, indicating that he heard something. So we all froze. We hardly breath, took a breath. We were trying to hear what he had heard. First, we only heard the sounds of the jungle. But then about a minute later, we heard uh, what he had heard. It was the crack, crack, crack of something moving towards us through the bamboo. Uh, then we heard crack, crack, crack on the other side of us. So there, we were 
something or someone was moving towards us from two different directions. Um, if there was any doubt in our minds, uh, that was uh, dispelled when we heard metal on metal and we heard a Vietnamese voice speaking no more than maybe 30 or 40 yards away. Um, so we were prepared for the inevitable. We circled in a 360 degree posture uh, with our weapons pointing outboard. Uh, I looked out the corner of my eye and I saw that uh, our Navy corpsman who was with us, Doc Willis, uh, was raising his rifle to his shoulder. It seen something. I looked there and I saw exactly what he saw. There was a North Vietnamese soldier standing no more than 10 feet in front of him who had parted the elephant grass and was looking right at us. Uh, that was the last thing the North Vietnamese soldier saw because Willis shot him in the tent in the chest on full automatic and he was killed instantly. What followed was a horrendous firefight at close range with, uh, we estimated 50 to 60 uh, North Vietnamese soldiers. Um, the, we had an advantage in that our team was pretty experienced. We had been in this kind of situation before and we knew how to react. Also, these North Vietnamese soldiers did not appear to be well trained. They were firing high and they were below us. So they were not inflicting any casualties with with uh, rifle fire. You said there were about 50 to 60. Well, how many is on a team, on your team? Eight. There were eight, eight of us. There were seven, seven seven Marines and one corpsman. So you were pretty well outnumbered, and they knew where you were. And they knew where we were. Uh, what's really saved us was uh, Lance, uh, or Corporal uh, Bart Russell, who had a a machine gun called a, a Stoner Light machine gun. And he used that machine gun with telling effect uh, to uh, beat back the attack. Uh, we exchanged grenades with the enemy. Two grenades came into uh, where we were. Uh, one failed to go off, but one did go off. And two, uh, two of the uh, uh, two of our Marines were wounded, badly wounded, not badly wounded, but significantly wounded. They had a lot of blood on their face. They had facial wounds from shrapnel, but they continued to fight. Uh, they wiped the blood out of their eyes and uh, continued to fight. Uh, then something happened that was really miraculous. Uh, for some reason, and we don't know who started it. Uh, the Marines started to laugh and taunt the enemy. And uh, for some reason, the enemy sort of probably thought these were really crazy people up on this hill, and maybe we had more than they, they had thought. They stopped the attack. They pulled back. They left their dead and wounded uh, in front of us. Uh, about that same time, we heard that the helicopters were on the way. Uh, we told the pilot uh, that uh, we had had significant contact, and we would understand if he did not come in and get us. He said that he's going to come in anyway. He came in. Uh, we boarded the helicopter. But as we were lifting off, the North Vietnamese opened up, hit the helicopter at least a dozen times, severed a hydraulic line. You could see the purple fluid uh, coming down through the interior of the, uh, of the cabin. Uh, he was able to take the crippled helicopter back to Da Nang, drop off our wounded at Charlie Med, and uh, returned us to uh, Camp Reasoner, and we prepared for another patrol. But that, that's the kind of patrols we went on. You mentioned a while ago when you were talking, uh, the North Vietnamese, uh, was it North Vietnamese or Viet Cong? Which it was North Vietnamese. North Vietnamese. Okay, so those are the, those were the people who were trained uh, just like our soldiers most of the time, uh, except the ones were conscripted and brought down. But you mentioned the guy who was sticking his head out through some elephant grass. Uh, for those of you out there, uh, if you've ever seen a wheat field, think about a uh, wheat field about 10 or 12 feet high. And uh, you could get, re you could be, you could almost reach out and touch somebody without them seeing you in, in the elephant grass. So um, it had to be, if, how much, ele a lot of elephant grass around you or were you in a clearing or? No, that, there was a lot of elephant grass about it. Recon teams usually would go into what they call a harbor site. We would try to find the thickest, uh, thickest foliage possible because it served as a warning if anybody was trying yeah. to approach and it served the purpose here. Uh, they had to break through bamboo to get to us, and uh, they caused a lot of a lot of noise, and uh, that that gave them away. Had they been moving through just elephant grass, they probably would have gotten right on top of us, and we would have all lost our lives. Yeah. Well, that's uh, there's in more, in stories like that in 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 Killer Cane. Yes, there's quite a few. I cover every patrol we went on in Killer Cane. Okay, all right. Uh, let's see. Uh, you wrote two books. Mm -hmm. You've written lots of articles, but you wrote two books. Uh, was that's the first one was Killer Kane was your first tour. That's correct. Uh, were you there for the 13 months? You said 10 months, but you were there for 13. 
I was, I was, uh, they, they took me out of the field uh, after 10 months and assigned me to a new, uh, they made me executive officer of a battalion reconnaissance company. And we spent about a month more in, in Vietnam than we went to uh, Okinawa for two months and trained there. Uh, uh, and then I left from Okinawa. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, now, how long were you back in the States before you went back? I was back only eight months. Uh, I was assigned to a really cushy job. I was uh, at Marine Barracks 8th and I. That's the, the place that uh, is in Washington, D.C., where they put on parades uh, and uh, ceremonies for visiting dignitaries and the like. I also was a White House social aide as a secondary duty. Um, it, was a, it was a very nice job, but I received a letter while I was there from my former commanding officer who told me my platoon had been seriously hurt at, at way. They were used as conventional infantry instead of reconnaissance. They went up there to, as a reaction force in the Battle of Way. And, um, was so, that during Tet? That was during Tet. Oh, that was a tough And um, they were actually ambushed, and uh, two were killed, and I think uh, about six or seven of uh, them were wounded. And of course, I only had a 15-man platoon. It was only 15-man platoon that I had. So was, I decided then to go back, and uh, uh, my commanding officer at the barracks uh, had invested a lot of time and effort training me to be a ceremonial officer, and he didn't want me to go, but he, he was a World War II uh, veteran of Iwo Jima, and he said, well, if you're determined to go back and fight, go ahead and I'll, I'll let you go as soon as the parade season is over. And uh, he, he, he did that. He allowed me to go back. And I reported back uh, just uh, eight months later, I was back in country in 1968, beginning of December. Uh, <clears throat> my first job, uh, because I went back, I thought I should be with the infantry because I hadn't spent any time with the infantry. But because of my experience and my reputation with Killer Kane, they assigned me again to Force Reconnaissance Company. Um, and uh, they told me I'd be the uh, operations officer for that company. They were going to participate in an operation called Taylor Common operating in the southern portion of Guangdong province at a base called the Anhua Combat Base. And uh, we conducted uh, uh, missions uh, into Base Area 112 in western Guangdong. After uh, I, I still thought I should be in the infantry, so I talked to my commanding officer again and said, I've been here six months, can you let me go to the infantry? And he said, uh, you're crazy, but uh, I'll let you go. And uh, I did, I went to the 5th Marines, uh, commanded Golf Company, uh, two four, and uh, excuse me, two five, and uh, participated in normal infantry operations uh, for about. Uh, I was company commander for five months. Now, what was your rank then? I was a captain. Okay. I was a captain. Uh, while I was doing this uh, uh, job, we had a, a mission to go into an area called the Arizona Territory, which was a completely Viet Cong dominated area. Um, what we were, we were told we were going to take some Vietnamese with us. And, uh, these Vietnamese showed up, uh, at my, at our base on Hill 65. And, uh, they were really tough looking people. There was about 30 of them and they were being led by a, uh, a, an American. He was in camouflage utilities, uh, not American camouflage utilities. His cup face was covered with, uh, camouflage paint. I recognized him immediately as a, uh, a fellow Naval Academy uh, uh, graduate, uh, Fred Vogel. And uh, Fred said he had been assigned to the CIA. Uh, actually, he didn't say that. He just said, I've been assigned to a special program. If you would like to do the same kind of work that I'm doing, all you have to do is extend for six months, and I'll put you in for a recommendation to, to do this kind of work. He says, I can't tell you too much about it, except that you, know, you can see from what we're doing here in Arizona Territory, uh, that um, it's, it's, it's probably interesting. I says, well, again, not being very smart, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll extend. My parents weren't particularly pleased with that, uh, but I went ahead and did it anyway. Um, got orders to go to Saigon and report to a hotel called the Duke Hotel. Now, at the time, I didn't know anything about the Duke Hotel, but that is the CIA's uh, billeting hotel. Yeah. Before you get into that story, I mm -hmm. wanted to ask you, uh, try uh, explain to our uh, viewers out there the difference between the long range and a uh, a uh, basically infantry unit. Well, they're they're very different. The infantry's uh, primary mission is close with and destroy the the enemy. They're uh, uh, 
their job is to, uh, you know, to conduct patrolling, lay ambushes, uh, conduct sweeps, uh, those kinds of things. But their, their main purpose is to, to, to get it on with the enemy, to uh, get a hold of the enemy and kill them. Uh, reconnaissance is there to acquire intelligence, uh, to observe enemy movement, and to report that back to higher headquarters so the infantry can be employed uh, with some knowledge about what they're going up against. That's the, that's the difference. So reconnaissance, you tried, you tried not to let them know that you were there. You ha- you ha- In yeah. the infantry, you tried to let them know that you were there. Oh, you definitely. That's a, that's a good, good description. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Just go ahead. I'm- well, when I reported to the Duke Hotel, I didn't know what I was really looking for. I thought, you know, some, I went to the front desk and said, my name's Captain Finlayson. And uh, they said, oh, yeah, uh, we have a room for you. But before you check into your room, there's this... Uh, gentleman over here wants to see you. And there over to my side was a very nasty looking uh, Vietnamese, a big guy in a uniform I didn't recognize with a uh, strange looking beret on. And he said, uh, are you, are you Captain Finlayson? And I said, yes, sir, I am. And he said, well, come with me. And I, I felt like saying, well, wow, uh, uh, why am I going to go with you? I don't know you or anything. Uh, I'm in Saigon. That's the first time I've ever been in Saigon. But I went with him anyway. We went to a villa, and he, he wouldn't answer any questions on the ride over there. Just kept quiet. He says, you'll find out. Went into this villa. Uh, the first floor had a lot of, uh, not a lot, maybe a dozen Vietnamese in civilian clothes doing what looked like paperwork. And uh, I was introduced to a, a man called Major uh, Lang. who was He said he was the boss. He said, the American boss wants to see you. So he took me upstairs and introduced me to a, a man who first off told me he was a brigadier general in the Marine Corps. Later found out he was a lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps, but he, he felt that it was necessary to let everybody know that he was a brigadier general so he got some respect and got access. Uh, he ran the entire program uh, for the uh, CIA. Um, he had a army captain with him who I didn't know was an army captain at the time. He was in civilian clothes as well. They sat me down, interviewed me for about two hours, and they asked me questions I thought were rather strange. They didn't ask me about my reconnaissance background, what I did in the infantry or anything like that. They asked me about, did I have any Vietnamese friends? Uh, did I know anything about Vietnamese history? Uh, had I read any books about uh, the Viet Cong and the political leadership of the, uh, the enemy? Um, it, was, it was kind of a bizarre um, uh, interview for such a long period of time, but they were really trying, I think, to get to find out my feelings towards the Vietnamese. They said, well, here's a book called The Viet Cong by Douglas Pike. It tells you all you need to know about what you're going to be up against. I want you to take this back to the hotel. I want you to read it in its entirety tonight, commit it to memory, come on back tomorrow morning, and we'll tell you whether or not we accept you or not. Uh, I stayed up till about three in the morning, but I was tired. And so after reading about two thirds of the book, and skimming the rest, uh, I went to bed and woke up at uh, six o'clock, uh, had breakfast. And while I was having breakfast, there was another officer there who had come down with me to interview as well. He told me he was going back to Da Nang. He had been rejected for the position. And I says, oh, what, 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 what was the reason given? He said, no reason given. They just rejected me. And he was not very pleased with that. Uh, I went back to the, uh, back to the uh, villa again. Uh, they said that you're accepted. Uh, by the way, we were going to send you up to Tua Tien province in i Corps because that's where most Marine Provincial Reconnaissance uh, Unit uh, advisors go. But we've had a serious problem in Tainan province, which is located about 72 kilometers northwest of uh, Saigon. We had to relieve the man that's doing the job up there be- because of corruption. They wouldn't give me other, any other details other than they, they wanted to court-martial this individual. Um, at the time, they said that there was, it was extremely important to cover Tain Inn, and I didn't realize why. But later I found out, uh, to make a long story short, Tain Inn was uh, the place where the CIA controlled the, the best spy we had inside the enemy. Uh, he was known as the Tain Inn source. Very few people knew his real name. Uh, I was never told at all about him. I was suspicious of something that was going on there because several of my crew missions were either delayed or canceled. And I thought we had good intelligence on the target, but we were were prevented from uh, carrying the mission out. So I was very suspicious of of why that had happened. 
I confronted my boss, who was a senior CIA officer there in the in the villa. Um, they called him the Poik, the provincial officer in charge, and I asked him why these missions were being canceled. And he said, "Andy, you don't need to know. You shouldn't know. You go out in the field. If you're captured, you will. You might reveal what we don't want revealed, and you don't have a need to know." So I says, "Okay, that's fine with me." Um, later on, about 30 years later, I was attending a seminar at uh, in Texas, and a CIA officer presented a paper identifying the Tainan source. And I was shocked. I said, I signed a non-disclosure agreement when I left Vietnam, never to mention anything I knew about what I was doing. And he said, that's okay. You, you can apply to have your, your uh, have that lifted. And I did. Uh, his name was Merrill Prebino. He's a distinguished CIA uh, historian and researcher. Um, I found out the name of the individual, which I'd never known before, and I also found out what, to, what he did. Uh, he was a, a spy for us for 10 years, mm. and he was highly placed. He was able to go to Cosvin, which is their headquarters, and receive briefings. We knew some of their strategy and, and uh, operations even before the people and their, their, their communist cadres in, in South Vietnam. This man had a... Uh, I guess you call it a um, identic memory. He could mem memorize everything. And uh, he would get briefings. No one was allowed to take notes in Cosman. They were not allowed to. They, had to, uh, they were very security conscious. Uh, he would come back, and he, because he had memorized everything he heard, he would, he would write it all down and uh, go to, go to a, uh, a drop, a uh, dead drop. Or he would be taken into Saigon. Later on, he was taken into Saigon into a safe house and was debriefed. But initially, he was, they just used a dead drop. Uh, they also used some other devices, which I can't talk about. But he was, he was very closely protected, gave us great intelligence. Unfortunately, a lot of that intelligence was not acted upon, the strategic intelligence. Why, I don't know, but it never was. Uh, uh, the uh, that, I can tell you what he must have had a uh, quite complicated life because he well he he was killed he was, well, he, was. He, he was actually betrayed by uh, uh, his case officer this is an interesting story I had a, a run in with we had two interpreters in our villa one was Mr Lam who worked for me and then there was Mr Fong who worked for the uh, for the special branch uh, advisor I thought Mr Fong was just an interpreter he was not he was really the Vietnamese case officer for this spy. And uh, later on, uh, because Mr. Fong got married, and they weren't allowed to have married people controlling uh, assets in Tainan, he, he was transferred to another province. He was captured uh, prior to the fall of Saigon, and he betrayed uh, this individual to the communists. Um, the communists had some real trouble identifying, identifying him because the CIA had signed documentation using other communists' signatures. And so the, the communists arrested a lot of their own people trying to find this guy. Uh, but ultimately, they did find him. He was arrested two weeks after the fall of Saigon because of the betrayal of Mr. Fong. Uh, he was, died under interrogation. Uh, the communists uh, said that uh, he died because, of a heart, because he committed suicide. Then they said he died of a heart attack. But uh, we know that he died under interrogation from being submitted to a great deal of torture because he knew an awful lot. And to this day, his, um, the CIA will not talk about him at all. And I have several FOIA requests in because I want to write a book about him. They will not mention one word about this guy, even though he's been dead since 1975. But the North Vietnamese write about him a lot. And Merrill Pribino translates their uh, articles. And uh, they, they use this case for their, their uh, security forces as an example of how the CIA was able to protect an asset for 10 years and uh, such a highly placed asset. And, uh, you know, you, you got to be careful when you're dealing with the CIA. Yeah. When, uh, speaking of that, when you were, uh, when you were with them, uh, were you still considered part of the Marine Corps? Uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting what they did is, is the CIA, when they took over the, the PRU program or the Phoenix program, mm -hmm. uh, they didn't have enough case officers 
to fill all the billets, especially the, the paramilitary uh, job. Um, so they, they went to the Department of Defense and said, we need military people to fill these billets in rural development or revolutionary development and in the, the provincial reconnaissance units. They took 400 initially, gave them uh, the basic course that a CIA agent would get and uh, some intelligence training at uh, Fort Holabird, and then they sent them to Vietnam to fill these billets. That was the first increment. I was the, sort of the second increment. Uh, they just took me because they needed a warm body with, I guess, with some combat experience. Uh, but that was a big problem. The CIA did not have the manpower to fill all their billets, uh, and that included everything. Uh, I can't go into all the details on that, but, but uh, they had difficulty finding qualified people to, uh, to fill the jobs that the, they had signed up for. Well, still, even then, <clears throat> it, uh, if, it would be very hard for you to be around uh, other Marines or Marine officers uh, because you couldn't tell them what you were doing and you didn't really want to get into that conversation at all. No, you that. couldn't because we, when, we, when I left the job, uh, I had to sign a, a non-disclosure agreement at the embassy. And, and had an out brief and was told not to talk about anything that I did uh, forever. So I didn't. Um, it, um, it, it, it wasn't uh, too difficult to do, I think. Uh, I've been absolved of that responsibility for about 10 years now, so I can, I can talk with a little bit more candidly about mm -hmm. what I did. I, but your answer about was I actually assigned to the CIA, what they did is they signed these, all of these people to MACV. And my cover was, oddly enough, the 69th Mobile Heavy Construction Unit. And I had IDs and all the cover you would need in case I got captured. I was a, uh, you know, I could talk engineer because I was mm -hmm. trained as an engineer. Um, and uh, they gave me actually a false name. I had a false name that I could use. Um, but I got paid by MACV. I would go into MACV uh, once a month and get uh, my pay. But... Everything else was provided by the CIA. My boss was the CIA. I didn't take any orders from any military people. And sometimes I had to, had to deal with um, both State Department and military people who were difficult to deal with. And they thought I was a civilian. I always wore civilian clothes unless I was going on operation. And then I wore a, either a Peru uniform or American uh, Tiger Stripe uniforms with no identification on them. Would you consider that your most uh, interesting assignment or I, one of the others? Or? No, I think that was my most, uh, my most interesting assignment, uh, very unique and different. Today, uh, Marines, a few Marines are assigned to the CIA, but they have a, a special division for it. It's called the Special Activities Division. And uh, we've actually had a couple of Marines killed uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, serving with the CIA. Mm -hmm. Well, folks out there, I'm going to highly recommend Christmas is coming. Uh, a great Christmas gift would be uh, Killer Kane, uh, the stories there, or the uh, Rice Paddy Recon uh, that the colonel wrote. And along with, uh, there's also available his Marine Advisors uh, with the um, uh, Vietnamese Provincial Recon uh, Units. Uh, that was the, the proof he was talking about a while ago, the PRU. Uh, in the military, we always talk in, uh, in, in, in codes there. But, uh, Colonel, I also want you to talk about, uh, yeah, well, I'm going to see this next slide here. Just tell us about this, this group. Well, this is a picture of, of the 5th Marines, uh, or excuse me, this is a picture of the 5th Platoon, the one I commanded. It's a composite of Killer Kane and another team called Brisbane. I, I had both of them in my platoon. We went on a larger mission into a place called Happy Valley. It wasn't a happy place, believe me. But uh, we ambushed uh, a company of the 402nd Sapper Battalion, and uh, we killed uh, two of them. The rest of them ran away. But we captured a lot of equipment, uh, those flags you see, <clears throat> and also a lot of documents that uh, actually talked about Tet. They were doing uh, reconnaissance work uh, in preparation of Tet. Uh, don't know what was done with those documents other than that that's what the G2 told us. Interesting story about those flags. Those flags were awarded to this 402nd Sapper Battalion by the Da Nang Central Committee. <clears throat> we wanted to keep those flags in the company as souvenirs. 
along with the weapons and a lot of other things. But uh, the, the weapons and a lot of the souvenirs all disappeared because they left us out in the field. And we just sent the gear back with another team that came out to pick them up. So when we got back to Da Nang, all that was left were those weapons you see placed in front of us and those flags. Everything else had been purloined by our colleagues and people in the G2 at, up at uh, Division. The general uh, in charge of the 1st Division wanted those flags and those weapons to put on display up in the, at the headquarters. So <clears throat> we said, I, you know, being a good Marine, I said, okay, we'll, we'll surrender them. But my commanding officer, Captain Dixon, decided that we weren't going to do that. What we were going to do is we were going to get a woman who was a so-so lady, in other words, a, a seamstress, to duplicate these flags in Da Nang and get them back to us in one night. So we would present them to uh, the general the next, next morning, which we did. And he took these false flags, had them placed in his, and all these weapons placed on a bulkhead or a wall behind him uh, as trophies. The actual flags were hidden in our company area, and Captain Dixon took them back. He became the uh, uh, director of athletics at the University of South Carolina, and he retained the flags. Uh, so that's where they are. The original, the, the, original, the real ones are there in, uh, in uh, South Carolina with uh, Captain Dixon. So uh, where the fake ones are are probably in the Marine Corps <laughs> Museum some way. Well, you know, a lot, a lot of a lot of the guys back in the back in the back uh, and so forth bought a, a lot of those flags that were made and and sold when they when the guys come back. Looking at the picture there, you can see quite a conglomeration of uniforms and weapons, and uh, you know, I don't see anything that looked like it was an American weapon. They're all they're all RPGs and RPDs, and uh, and that's me. I'm the, uh, the the tired looking gentleman holding up the flag. I'm the second one in from the uh, from the left. Next to me is Corporal Barecki. Okay, that's a kind of a motley looking crew there. Well, they're tough guys. They are tough yeah. guys. Yeah. Uh, you didn't worry about uh, nice clean uniforms and shaves in that group? No, not at all. all right. uh, one of the things <clears throat> I wanted to talk to you about was uh, I know you're uh, involved now with a group, uh, Vietnam Veterans for Factual History. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had... Uh, uh, one of one of the one of the guys on several times, uh, mm -hmm. Del Vecchio, or as we call him, Dale. Um, and one of the things y'all have talked about, and I've worked, and Dale and I have talked about on here, was the Ken Burns fiasco. I, mm -hmm. To me, I, it scares me that the that the kids and people in school are using this as the definitive history of the Vietnam War, and it's pretty much like uh, a lot of other things. There's a lot of uh, stretching of the truth or to downright, uh, well, uh, lies in some spots. Right. Can you back a moment? To yeah, we, we did a lot of work on the, on the uh, documentary, if you can call it that. Uh, we contacted Ken Burns two years before he finished it. We talked to his assistant, a uh, woman who uh, uh, did a lot of the uh, gathering of information on the, on the documentary. Uh, they completely stiffed us. Uh, we had some very distinguished scholars and veterans that we thought could add to the uh, documentary. They refused to even talk to us about it. Only one member of the Vietnam Veterans for Factual History actually was uh, 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 asked to comment, and that was Bill, uh, Bob Sorley. And Bob Sorley had, I think, a total, he was interviewed for two hours. They used less than a minute of his time, I think, in the documentary. Uh, what is wrong with the documentary is it reinforces the conventional narrative of the anti-war movement, that the war was illegal, immoral, and unwinnable. And just about everybody other than Bob Sorley and Rufus Phillips and maybe one or two others uh, sort of reinforced that, that myth, that false narrative. Um, Burns, of course, is a liberal. Uh, his staff is is a lib are liberals. They sort of bought into the, uh, the this conventional narrative that the war was illegal, immoral, and unwinnable, uh, largely due to the kind of people they recruited to be their advisors. The the general officer who was advisor to the documentary is a, a notorious anti-war guy, uh, an Air Force officer who saw the war from you know twenty five thousand feet and is considered an expert according to Burns. Um, and, and uh, 
some, there's a Marine in there who figures prominently in the documentary who hates Vietnamese. He's, he was a major player in the Vietnam veterans against the war, um, notorious anti-war person. Uh, uh, Craig Dattis, uh, who is a professor at West Point, is another anti-war, unwinnable war type uh, academic who was brought in. The whole thing was skewed towards the anti-war movement. And I'll give you an example of the bias that's involved. You know, more Vietnamese died in the war than Americans. Sure, it's an American war, and the documentary is about the American presence during the war. But the Vietnamese on both sides suffered a lot more. So what did the, what did the document, what, what, what was the Vietnamese content of the document? There were 29 Vietnamese that were interviewed for that docu document, document, documentary. <laughs> Document. Yeah, the drama. Yeah. And um, of those 29, 20 were communists. 20 of them were, you know, North Vietnamese soldiers or Viet Cong. Of the nine remaining, two of those are anti-war academics uh, with no experience in the military at all. They were just academics. Uh, one of them was uh, 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 a researcher for the RAND Corporation who numerous times said we were supporting the wrong side, the good guys were the communists. So that gives you an idea of the bias in that documentary. And it's, it's, it, it creates a very false narrative. Also, another bias, all the battles that get any, any coverage at all were battles where Americans suffered heavy losses or the Vietnamese lost. None of the victories are cataloged at all in that documentary. So uh, it's just, to me, it, it's just a... Uh, a poorly done uh, anti-war uh, screed, I guess, is the best thing I could describe it's, it It's kind of like he had an agenda <clears throat> when he started. Oh, uh, he clearly and so he did. And clearly uh, did. I know that uh, I've spoke to uh, a lot of the Vietnamese mm -hmm. here, uh, and uh, they were not too happy with the documentary and because the way they were uh, portrayed. Uh, portrayed in mm -hmm. there. And, and very little, of, they spent a whole lot more time, as you said, with the, with the communists uh, and hardly and nothing from the real South Vietnamese soldier. Yeah, I would like to, like to talk about that because I had, you know, during the first uh, two years I was in Vietnam, I really had very little contact with Vietnamese. I had some Vietnamese friends, uh, but I didn't have a lot of contact with the Vietnamese. I personally like the Vietnamese, but I really got to love them when I worked with them when I was with the CIA. Um, I, I dealt with provincial chiefs, district chiefs, uh, my counterparts, and I found them all to be honorable people, uh, good people. They were patriotic. They believed in uh, democracy as they defined it. Uh, they did not want to live under communism. Many of them had suffered under communism in North Vietnam and had come down south. Uh, many of them had suffered uh, terrible atrocities against their family. One, I'll just give you one example of what I'm talking about. One of my team leaders in the PRU was uh, uh, Mr. Sim. Mr. Sim was a tall, strong Vietnamese man. He had been a Viet Minh uh, soldier as a young man. Uh, he did not like the Viet Minh because of what they did. He, he thought that they were uh, con completely controlled by the communists. Uh, he became a village security uh, soldier uh, in Tainan province. While he was away at uh, a marketplace, the Viet Cong came in and they murdered his wife, his five children, uh, and his uh, mother, uh, and did it in a very, very terrible way. Now, he was a true believer because of what they had done to him. There was no way you're going to take that guy prisoner alive. And in fact, when Saigon fell, he's one of those few that did not fall for their line. That all you have to do is come in and, you know, we'll let you go after three yeah. days. He, he, re, he remained and became a participant in a stay-behind operation called the Yellow Dragons and actually conducted guerrilla warfare from Cambodia against, um, against the communists uh, for several years. I, I think he's probably lost his life in that effort, um, but for several years he was he was doing that because he was fundamentally opposed to to the communists. Yeah, I, I go into schools quite a bit uh, and so forth, and it, it really get gets to me uh, knowing that some of the teachers are using that as the the quote history uh, of the Vietnam Vietnam War. In fact, uh, 
I wrote a letter to uh, Vietnam Veterans of America magazine mm. where I stated on about two pages how I could not understand a organization of Vietnam veterans would not come out and say something about the documentary and how it was wrong, but uh, never heard anything back from them. And it's like Vietnam Magazine the same way. It's a fantastic magazine. I get it. Uh, it was started by uh, uh, quite an officer himself. But these magazines, is, it, just, their silence is the same thing as going out and says, hey, that was the truth and, and so forth. It just, it, I just don't understand from my point uh, why it's just, are, are they afraid of uh, Ken Burns and, and, uh, and his backing or just, why do you think these organizations, I mean, without the Vietnam Veterans for Factual History, uh, I, and, and a few people like me, I don't think anybody would out there would have even known it was anything questionable. Well, the, the, the problem is Ken Burns has a, um, uh, a following. Mm -hmm. uh, he's done a good job, say, with uh, history of baseball, Civil War, but all of his presentations have a very sort of left-wing focus to them. Uh, even when he covers baseball, he, he, you know, he can't get away from constantly talking about race. Uh, he's, he's just a, you know, what I call a card carrying liberal. Um, he means Hollywood liberal. He means, well, he has, a, he's, he's really not a, a historian. Most of his work is done by his staff. His job is to get money for his productions. And he's very, very good at getting money for it. And so he goes to organizations that have deep pockets who are willing to, to promote his documentaries. And to do so, they have to sort of follow a, a, a party line, if you will. Um, we, we spent a lot of time with, with trying to get uh, their staff to even listen to us, and they would not because they would just cast aspersions at us, calling us revisionists. Now, thankfully, a lot of young historians now are becoming revisionists. They're taking that conventional narrative and subjecting it to unbiased criticism. And you're seeing a lot of uh, recent uh, academic journals and academic books coming out that sort of refute that, uh, that sort of pro-communist line that the documentary takes. Yeah. Uh, this organization, uh, for those of out there in the audience, I, I hope one of the reasons you watch this show is you're trying to uh, find out the real truth or the real story of the Vietnam War, which we uh, have kind of as our mission. Uh, this organization that uh, the colonel is a mentor of, uh, the Vietnam Veterans for Factory History, and if you look on the screen there, uh, you'll see the website www.vbfh.org. And uh, they have some good information. And y'all have a, a, a magazine that comes out uh, every now and then. And you can go in and sign up. Uh, let me see the next screen, if you would. That's one of the magazines. And you just read, go on a site, register, and you can download. There's no charge for the it's magazines. Free. And uh, lots of, lots of uh, scholars, people who do a lot of research. I really, a lot of smart people uh, get together and put this magazine together. And they do it for one reason, is to get the truth out there uh, as part of our legacy. Because our legacy, as we came back, were drug addicts, baby killers, crazy people, alcoholics, and everything else. And uh, one of these days, they're going to start this, this group's going to start tearing out our memorials like they do the other memorials. And hopefully, uh, uh, Vietnam Veterans for Factory History can get the word out there and the real story out there. And I do appreciate all y'all's work for this organization. Well, let me, let me just add something to that, because factual history, that's what we deal with with facts only. You're not going to see a propaganda piece. Everybody has opinions. We don't promote opinions. We take a look at facts. We're sort of like a fact checker. Academics, journalists who are really interested in the truth can come to us. We can correct things. Example of this, uh, Mr. Carnell, who wrote a book uh, that's used a lot of times in the academic community of history of Vietnam, made some mistakes in his, his book. He, unlike a lot of other journalists, when we pointed out these mistakes, he went back and corrected the follow-on editions, and he thanked us for, for, for you know, bringing the truth to his, his book because he cared about that. Unfortunately, there are a lot of academics who are so invested in the sort of what I would call the pro-communist uh, view that they won't even, won't even listen to you when you point out a 
blatant mistake they made in some of their publications. Again, we're not propaganda, we're facts. So if anybody has any uh, doubts about something and whether or not it's true or not, check it with us and we'll go and we'll give you an honest answer. If we don't know, we'll tell you we don't know. But if we find a mistake, we'll correct it. Have you done anything on Mr. Turris's book? Oh, Mr. Turris, yes. Yes, we have. Mr. Turris, uh, uh, his book, uh, Shoot Anything That, that Walks, I think, is, is a real disservice and a poor example of journalism and academic work. So that's uh, 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 some of the work he's doing on a regular basis. Uh, like I said, he uh, has done a lot of work with the Marine Corps uh, University. Uh, he speaks uh, all over. Uh, you just did one uh, today, earlier today? No, or? last yesterday. Yesterday, okay. Mm -hmm. And so he's out there. He has promised to come back and tell us a little bit about the um, – uh, Phoenix program more. Uh, we've been talking about what was who was the most interesting Marine that you work with. There's a lot of characters out there, and I, I, I talk about all the time Al Gray. I, I, I think he was one of the most dynamic men I've ever met. And, well, he's he's one of the, one of the ones that I would mention, and also Jim Mattis. I served with uh, General Mattis on two occasions. He, we were both in the same battalion uh, twice, so I got to know him quite a quite well. We used to share books a lot because we both enjoyed reading history. And when we were on amphibious ships, you have a lot of free time to read. Uh, but the most interesting person I met was Chesty Puller. Uh, mm -hmm. For members of the audience who don't understand or don't know about Chesty Puller, he's probably the most famous Marine that ever lived. He had five Navy crosses, um, came up from ranks from private through to a lieutenant general. Uh, quite a guy. He was the real deal. And when I was a midshipman at the Naval Academy, I'd finished uh, doing some parachute training with uh, second SEALs, uh, SEAL Team 2 in Suffolk, Virginia. And on the way back, we decided to visit his home. He was retired at the time. And exercising bad judgment and incredibly, incredibly bad at manners, we showed up on his front, front porch unannounced on a cold December morning at around 7.30. Uh, his wife was not pleased. But uh, when she found out who we were and why we were there, she invited us in and gave us coffee and donuts. Uh, Chesty talked to us for about an hour and he gave us all some really good advice. He, he told us what good lieutenants do and what bad lieutenants do. And he said, uh, don't you ever do anything to sully the reputation of the Marine Corps. Don't you ever do that. That's a legacy of valor, and you have to uh, remember that. Whatever you do on your career, remember that you, you have a reputation that was gained by the sacrifices of those who went before you, and don't sully that reputation. I want to. Uh, we're running. We're running short on time, so I want to bring up a couple things that are coming going on. If you're anywhere in the Triangle area, on the 15th of December at six o'clock p.m., uh, the candlelight service at the Vietnam Memorial State Capitol is very moving uh, ceremony. I highly recommend you be there for the candlelight service, where we honor those uh, 38 who are still missing from North Carolina, as well as the 1,600 and some we lost. That's 6 o'clock at the state capitol. Uh, by the way, December 22nd is beginning of Hanukkah. Uh, uh, coming up, celebrate Christmas. Remember those who are serving us and their families, uh, that they can't be with us. Uh, there's a lot of men and women out there today who uh, just like we spent time in Vietnam and other places serving, uh, serving our country. There's a lot of young men and women today who uh, volunteered. I, I volunteered to keep them being drafted, but uh, who volunteered to be out there. And not only is it hard on them to be without their families, but it's hard on their families. So as you go out there and, and enjoy your Christmas and so forth, remember those people out there who, get, who are out there now putting their lives on the line so that we can have our Christmas and the freedom. Uh, the Lessons of Vietnam show will not be aired on its normal day as it falls on Christmas Day. So I'm going to give you all the day off on Christmas Day. But uh, we will be back the 4th of, uh, let's see, 8th of January. We'll be back online just like we uh, always are. Uh, the 4th of January will be the monthly POW ceremony at the North Carolina State Capitol again, where we'll talk about the, in honor of the uh, 38. Uh, enjoy a safe New Year's. And we look forward to seeing you again on the 8th of January. I can't tell you what our subject's going to be right now, but we're working on, on several different things. So, uh, again, have a Merry, Merry Christmas or Happy Hanukkah. Uh, and be safe for the New Year's. And, Colonel, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, very enlightening information. 
Uh, we could have you for four or five more shows and, and still be uh, plenty of things to talk about. But again, thank you very much. And thank I just you. Appreciate uh, uh, it's it's amazing. I drove all the way to Atlanta to hear uh, hear him uh, speak and for him to find out he lives uh, just down the road from here. So uh, again, Merry Christmas to you and uh, Happy Hanukkah to Amnon. And I think we've covered everybody. So good night, all you folks out there. And remember, if there's anything you hear that you don't think was the truth, let me know so we can get it straightened out. Because it's, it's, it's just talking about we all want to get the real information out there. That's why we do all this work. Uh, that's why we have the Vietnam Veterans for Factual History. If you can prove that, show them that where they're wrong, I'm certain they'll cha uh, change it and get the word out that they did. So we want to do the same thing on the show. So uh, tell all your friends about us. Thank you. Bye. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.